If you're dealing with disciplinaries, maybe issuing warnings or even dismissals, responding to grievances or a whistleblowing situation, then an investigation is going to be essential. And in this video, I'm going to explain exactly what we mean by a workplace investigation and how you do one. My name is Jennifer, I'm the founder of Silk Helix and we are here to protect your business, train your business and help you grow your business. So let's go, let's dive into investigations. So when we're doing investigations, a key thing that we're looking at is the ACAS Code of Practice on disciplinary and grievance procedures, particularly when they're grievance or disciplinary investigations. Why are we bothered about this ACAS Code? It's not a statutory code, but it is considered to be good practice. The employment tribunals will look at whether or not you followed it. They would expect you to have followed it where you can, if you can. There are situations where it's just not possible, particularly in small businesses, but very often they're gonna be limited, those situations as to when it's not possible. This is the marker of good practice. It's the marker of whether you've done an investigation that's full, that's thorough, that considers all of the evidence and whether that dismissal is a fair dismissal, if that's where we're getting to. And fairness, I've spoken about this in many of my videos, but you've got legal fairness and you've got moral fairness. And actually investigations help us to achieve both. So legal fairness being the test of whether or not a dismissal is legally fair. So have we got the right grounds for dismissal? Have we done a full and thorough investigation? Did we have a reasonable belief based on that investigation? All of that comes into that test of whether or not it's fair dismissal. There's also morally fair and just ethically whether or not people feel like they're being treated fairly and a full and thorough investigation is going to help people to feel like they've been treated fairly. It is essential that you have a disciplinary procedure and a grievance procedure and that you tell people what these are and these should make it clear to people that you're going to do an investigation and usually that investigation is done by somebody different to the person that would make a disciplinary decision. With a grievance it can be the same person, disciplinary it will be a separate person and that's because the investigation is just about gathering the facts, it's not about making a decision, it's about looking at all the facts, gathering them together and presenting them in a way that can then be used in a disciplinary hearing to make the right decision. And for that reason, in terms of finding the right person to do the investigation, this really should be somebody who's impartial to the situation. Again, particularly if it's a disciplinary or a grievance that's about somebody or about a department, you would look for somebody who's independent to that. Ideally, somebody who's not been involved, not been a witness, not heard things on the grapevine, but somebody who can come in and gather the facts from a situation of just knowing what the complaint is and preparing the investigation from that point of view. And this is where we find in small organisations that can be much more difficult to do because you've got less people, people tend to all know what's going on. So it can be harder and the expectation is that you will do your best and you could bring in an external person and that can often help to support the argument that this is fair, it's independent, it's got a fresh set of eyes on it. So people like ourselves, um, HR consultants, will be able to come in and do investigations for you. Forgive the quick interruptions to this video and I will keep it really quick. If you've liked this video, found it useful, you can of course hit the subscribe button, but I also want to tell you about our digital courses. In our digital courses, I go into much more detail. The videos are very similar to these. It's me, it's on camera, but there's also downloads, there's sample forms, there's a few sample policies in there as well. All the things that you need to know. We've even got some coming where we've got live classes as well. So check out our digital courses. Details are on screen now and in the description below. Look forward to seeing you on one of our courses in the future. And in the meantime, I'll let you get back to the video. It is important that investigations are timely, that they are are done as soon as possible after the event or after the grievance has been raised. You're not leaving it too long. Don't appoint an investigating officer who's about to go on two weeks annual leave, for example. Get the investigation done quickly. A, you don't want workplace situations hanging over you, causing conflict, causing low morale, poor motivation, all of these things, possibly somebody going off sick, all these things that can go wrong when you don't deal with these things quickly let alone the risk of an employment tribunal and whether or not a dismissal is fair. I wouldn't even think about that right now. I'd be thinking that actually I need to get the workforce back in a place where people feel heard, they feel listened to, we've dealt with any situations that are arising and we can move on, we can motivate people again and pull people back together as a team. So in preparation for doing an investigation, you need to be looking at who are you going to speak to? Who are the witnesses? 
Now, an investigation in the workplace is a bit different to it is in a sort of police criminal investigation in that we can't go door knocking. So we can't go sort of asking everybody just to find out what might have happened. We need to only be calling people as witnesses if we've got a reason to believe they genuinely did witness it. So they've been named by somebody somewhere to say that actually, yeah, this person was there, they were present and it's worth speaking to them. A large reason for that is confidentiality. We need to maintain confidentiality as part of that investigation process. So the wider we take it, the more people we go and ask, the wider we're talking about this situation, we might be letting people know about something they wouldn't have known about otherwise. So we need to be really cautious of that. Also consider whether there's other evidence that you might want to look at, so documents, emails, IT monitoring, for example, CCTV, all of these things might be part of your investigation. Statements from customers might be in there as well. So just look at the wide range of things that you could in terms of what might form your evidence for your investigation. And try it before you start to make a list of all of the evidence you need to gather, all the people you need to speak to, and then think about what questions you'll need to ask those people. What is it you're looking to find out from them? For some of these people, these will be really short discussions, not very many questions. Others will have a lot more, but also be prepared to learn something new that changes your plan, perhaps widens the scope of your investigation, may mean there's new people to talk to, or you've got to ask follow-up questions. Don't stick to rigid questions in an interview because you do need to make sure that you've kind of gathered all the facts, you've checked your understanding, you've followed up um, on anything that somebody said to make sure that you have pulled out all of the details. And that's a really good reason why I would suggest that you do interviews over statements. Now, both of them are perfectly valid. The benefit of interviews is that you can ask follow-up questions, you can get those details, you can make sure that you've clarified the facts that somebody's giving you. We often find that when people write statements, they're very brief and there's an assumption that we know what they're talking about and we can read them and make assumptions as well. Whereas when we're doing an interview, we can relay back to somebody, we can ask follow-up questions, so we can really clarify that understanding and make sure that we are hearing exactly what they meant to convey to us and that we've checked that when they say they, we know exactly who they are and we're not making an assumption. It's really important then that we ask those open-ended questions. We don't want to be asking closed questions with yes, no answers very often, occasional times where they're valid, but most of the time we're looking at very open questions, giving people the opportunity to really give us what they think and that we're not asking leading questions. So we're not indicating our opinions by the questions that we're asking. And in terms of completing the investigation, remember this is a gathering of the facts. So we'd pull together a report uh, that might have things like a timeline, if that's relevant. It would have perhaps a summary of the responses people have given in relation to the allegations we were investigating the evidence for and against um, any allegation that we've got there would maybe in there, particularly if it's one where we can see that there's things on both sides. If we found mitigating circumstances, then that might be in there as well. So for example, if somebody in the investigation, we're talking about somebody who has not done something they should have done or done something in a different way to the way they should have done. And we then find that actually they didn't receive the last um, set of training that should have been given, we'd make sure that's in the investigation as potentially a mitigating circumstance. Particularly in a disciplinary investigation, we absolutely would not be recommending a dismissal or a particular level of warning. We may say this should go to a disciplinary hearing, but any decisions about the outcome on a disciplinary hearing should be made by the person chairing that hearing, not the person doing the investigation. We may make recommendations that are outside of any disciplinary situation. So for example, we might recommend training either for the individual or across the organization. We might recommend a policy review or change of practices. We might be saying, actually there's no case to answer. We haven't found any evidence and we don't believe there's any case to answer. So that's all absolutely okay and we should be wrapping that up as recommendations at the end of our investigation. So just to put it all together, particularly if it's a disciplinary investigation, make sure that you've got the ACAS code followed, also for your grievances as well. You need somebody who's impartial. This is just about gathering the facts. It's about putting together a report that shows what that evidence is, that you've looked at all the evidence 
and any recommendations that might come out of that. If there's anything that we can support you with, our details are in the description below and on screen now, do get in touch. Don't forget that we've got our digital courses, including one on disciplinary and grievances that goes into much more detail. Again, details are on screen. And if you found this video useful, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss a single one.